An English passenger named Charles Sansom on board the Ercolano gave the following statement to the newspaper, the Parlamento of Turin. Quote, After having supped with Sir Robert Peel, I went on deck to smoke a cigar. The night was very dark, and the sea exceedingly rough. I was walking backwards and forwards, and was astonished at not seeing anyone at the helm. The captain was in his cabin. I perceived a light at a certain distance, and I informed the helmsman, who made no reply. I repeated my warning with uneasiness, because it appeared to me that the light was coming towards us. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The Negligence of the Ercolano. Here we are. Enjoy! The Ercolano was described as a smaller paddlebox steamship of only 340 tons with a crew of 34, including the captain, Captain Francesco Michelli. A travel guide published the year before identified the Ercolano as part of the Neapolitan line, whose five ships traveled between Marseille, Naples, and Malta on a regular schedule. On the 24th of April, 1854, she departed from Genoa and headed to Marseille, just as her schedule dictated. On board, she had an array of distinguished guests, including Princess Cataneo Spinoza of Naples, who was a principal shareholder in the Neapolitan line. It was later rumored that the ship had departed a day behind schedule because she had exerted her influence to prevent the ship from setting sail on a Friday, since that would bring bad luck. This rumor ignored that the Ercolano departed Genoa on a Monday not a Saturday. The princess was not the only prestigious person on board of the El Colano for the voyage. Also on board was Sir Robert Peel, his close friend Charles Sansom, and a British member of Parliament named Thomas Plumer Halsey with his wife and child. There were other passengers on board as well, including the various staff and servants who traveled with the well-to-do passengers. It was later estimated that in total there were 40 passengers on the Ercolano, bringing the total number of people on the ship to 84. The night of the 24th of April was a clear one, but the sea was described as very choppy. Sir Robert Peel and Charles Sansom had enjoyed a very pleasant trip to Italy, and had been amazed at the Holy Week celebrations that had been held in the country, but now they were on their way back home. Peel had not originally intended to travel back to France by ship. He had planned on a land route, but his friend Sansom had suggested the sea route back, and Peel had agreed. The day before they embarked on the Arcolano, Peel and Sansom were both concerned to see that the wind was strong and the clouds were dark. They asked the sailor if there was going to be danger sailing the next day. The sailor told them that the Ercolano was one of the best ships sailing out of Genoa, and it would therefore be completely safe. Still, the two men found themselves discussing shipwreck, and Sansom asked Peel if he was able to swim. Peel replied that he could not swim at all with clothing on, so in a shipwreck situation, it was uncertain. As the voyage began, Peel almost immediately regretted getting on board. It would be claimed that he had a premonition of disaster, and that he had even asked Sansom to go to the captain with 200 pounds and request that they turn back, but that Sansom had calmed his nerves somewhat and convinced him this was a silly idea. In Peel's account of the events to come, he describes himself as having been painfully seasick due to the choppy seas which had been stirred up by the continued strong winds. Peel and Sansom had dinner together, but then Peel retreated to his carriage that was parked on the deck of the ship in the hopes that he would find some relief from his miserable motion sickness rather than going to his cabin. 
Sir Robert Peel was not the only one who was rumored to have had a dreadful premonition about their impending doom. A woman with whom the Halsey family had dined with in Turin, Italy on their way to Genoa would later tell actor Charles Maine Young that her late-night chat with the Halseys in their hotel room had been interrupted by their little boy's screams from the other room. Rushing to see what was the matter, they found the little boy very distressed, having just had a nightmare that his parents, as well as himself, had drowned in the sea. The parents knew that their young child was nervous about their upcoming voyage the next day, and soothed him and put him back to bed. By eleven o'clock at night, Many of the passengers had already gone to sleep on the Ercolano, including the Halsey family. Sansom, much like Peel, was feeling seasick due to the choppiness of the waves. He had taken a long nap in his cabin, and after dinner he tried smoking a cigar, but found that the smoke made him feel even worse and headed to the deck for relief. It was about half past eleven at this point, and the night was very dark. The only member of the crew that Sansom could see on the deck was the man at the helm, which concerned him. He was even more concerned when only a few minutes later he saw the light of another ship coming out of the darkness. Sansom, concerned about what was likely to be a coming collision if they or the other ship did not change course, shouted a warning to the helmsman in French, but he was ignored. As the other lights of the ship coming towards them appeared, Sansom switched from his warning to shouting for Captain Michelli, but this would also go unanswered. He could hear the ship's bell being struck, but if this was intended as an alarm or a warning, it was done far too late. Moments later, the 800-ton steamship, the Cecilia, smashed into the side of the Ercolano. The same afternoon that the Ercolano had departed from Genoa, the Cecilia had departed from Marseille, heading to Genoa under the command of Captain John Carson. Both ships had been traveling at full speed despite the rough waves. Unlike Captain Michelli, who does not seem to have been on deck at the time of the two ships meeting, Captain Carson was on the deck of the Cecilia, and he said that he had seen the lights of another ship in the distance. At first, he had thought that there was no danger because of the other ship's course. But then noticed with some distress that the other ship had changed course and they were now in danger. He says that he gave the order for his ship to change course slightly to try to avoid the collision, but that the other ship did not seem to make the same effort, and so they met. The defense team of Captain Michelli would later point out that Captain Carson was not entirely correct about where they were and the ship's exact positions, and they therefore suggested that his testimony about how he had maneuvered and how the Ercolano had maneuvered was not particularly reliable. As both captains would point a finger at one another, it is hard to determine whose facts were more accurate. But the unavoidable fact was that the much larger Cecilia plowed into the port side of the Ercolano at full speed between her paddlebox and stern. Sansom, who was still standing on the deck, had the startling moment of watching the other ship crash right into where his cabin was, and had the knowledge that, if he had not gone up to the deck, he would have been crushed. The force with which the Cecilia struck the Ercolano nearly cut the smaller ship in half. Water entered the stricken ship in torrents, and almost immediately the boiler fire was put out. Steam soon covered the ship and brought with it the new danger of heat and lack of visibility for the people who were still below decks. On the deck, the masts and funnel of the ship came crashing down, adding a danger to the people who were there. Peel hardly had time to dive out of his carriage before the funnel hit it and threw it overboard. He was fortunate to be on the bow portion of the Ercolano, which was not settling as quickly as the stern half of the ship. But it made little difference. The Ercolano was sinking so quickly that everyone was going to have to find a way to escape. Once Peel was out of his carriage, he began to strip himself of his clothing, reminiscent of the conversation he had previously with Sansom before they had gotten on board. One of Peel's servants, an old man who had served the family for forty years, came and found him while he was occupied in this, and 
fearing that neither of them would survive once the ship sank. Peel took a moment to reassure the man that even if they both were to meet an end due to the sinking ship, he had made provisions already for his servant's daughter in his will. The servant replied that he would never leave Peel's side, but Peel rejected this, feeling that the most likely way for either of them to survive was for each of them to look after themselves as best they were able to, without worrying about the other. Peel then told his servant that he was going to leap into the sea and try to get away from the ship before it dragged him down. He did not see what his servant did after that. But he dove from the ship and got a hold of the bowsprit of the Cecilia, which had been torn away in the collision. In total, the sinking of the Ercolano would only take five minutes at the most. And soon, the water was filled with struggling people clinging to wreckage in the darkness. Two of the sailors on board of the Ercolano, working very quickly, had managed to launch a boat before the ship went down. Sansom got into it, and once in the water shouted as many times as he could for his friend Peel, but got no response. Sansom was the only passenger to find a place on the Ercolano's boat. He would not even know that Peel had survived until he received a telegram on reaching Leon's. The Cecilia also launched four boats, though it would take them some time to do so, and began to search the darkness for anyone clinging to the wreckage. Some of them had been injured in the wreck, and were in rough condition when they entered the water, while others were quickly weakened and suffered due to the cold, rough sea they found themselves in. One passenger, a man named Knight, fought hard to save his wife and their three children, only to see all of them sink beneath the waves. He himself was very badly injured and had his hand crushed, but he was able to hold onto the wreckage until one of the Cecilia's boats found him. Peel was also pulled from the water by one of the boats, but only after clinging to the wreckage for almost an hour. He had abandoned the bowsprit and found a better piece of wreckage to hold on to, one that he initially shared with three other people, including the servant he had spoken to as the ship had gone down. Unfortunately, in the long period of time that passed before rescue, the people dropped off of the wreckage one by one, leaving only Peel, who was described as athletic, still holding on by the time the boat found him. Captain Michelli had come to the deck from his cabin where he had reportedly been sleeping immediately after the collision. But when the mast had fallen and a portion of it struck him and knocked him almost senseless, he found himself in the water. He would later say that the only thing that had brought him to his senses was the sound of the voice of his 16-year-old son who had also been traveling with him. On seeing his father knocked down by the mast, the boy had called to his father to save him. Michelli had not been able to find his son in the chaos and darkness, but it had compelled him to swim and join the others and clinging onto the wreckage until one of the boats of the Cecilia found him. On coming on board of the Cecilia, he had a joyful reunion with his son, who had also been pulled out of the water. While the reunion of father and son was a happy moment, it also added an extra bitter taste in the mouth of some of the passengers. Many of the men who did survive had lost their families or other people they knew in the wreck, but they could not help but notice that all of the ship's officers, the captain and his son, were all safe. It was true that some of the sailors had been lost, but when the total saved was tallied, it was discovered that 14 passengers and 22 members of the crew had survived. Only one woman was saved out of all of the female passengers who had been on board. Maria Ambrusano was a chambermaid and had been on deck when the collision had occurred, unlike most of the female passengers who had retired early and were below deck, giving them less of a chance to escape. The people who were pulled out of the water by the crew of the Cecilia did not have many more nice things to say about Captain Carson than they did about Captain Michelli. 
Not only had the boats of the Cecilia not been launched until after the Ercolano had sunk, but Captain Carson had also given the order for the ship to continue its voyage while it was still dark. The Cecilia was not badly damaged and had no need to rush to port, and the passengers of the Ercolano suspected that if they had waited until daylight, they might have had a chance to spot more people clinging to the wreckage. They were somewhat vindicated in this when another ship saved a passenger and a member of the crew who were still clinging to a piece of the wreck near Nice. The Cecilia also did not offer much comfort to the save, because as it continued its voyage, it hit a severe storm that made at least Peel concerned he was about to be shipwrecked a second time. This rough sea was even worse for Sansom and the three members of the crew he was in a small boat with. Sansom would later say he considered it a miracle that they did not sink, but somehow they managed to row to Antibes from where Sansom was able to travel to Nice. The Cecilia landed the survivors back in Genoa, where many of them required medical attention immediately, including Peel, who had developed frostbite in his feet. The sailors, who had pulled him from the water, had done their best and dressed him in their own clothing to keep him warm, but the damage had already been done. As soon as Peel found himself on board of the Cecilia, he had passed out, and it took them some time to revive him. On reaching Genoa, a new hardship arose for some of the passengers. They had lost everything, and the English consul, who they described as very hard-hearted, still refused to issue them new passports so they could get home without paying him the fee. This situation was only resolved once Peel stepped forward and offered to pay any required fees. Knight was among the people who returned to England, but he was never able to recover. Three months, it was reported that Knight, who had watched his entire family go down, had himself fallen victim to the injuries he had sustained. The sinking of the Ercolano was only the start of what would prove to be an incredibly protracted legal battle between the two captains, both of whom accused the other of negligence. Captain Carson initially tried to argue that, as an English citizen, the court had no right to try him at all, despite both of the ships flying the Italian flag. Meanwhile, Captain Michelli tried to argue that the courts did not have jurisdiction over him, but he should instead stand before a naval court, since he had been awarded the title of lieutenant. This was found to be an honorary title, and, much like Captain Carson's argument, it did not meet with much success. Captain Carson had the many statements from the passengers on his side about the total lack of a lookout that had been present on the Ercolano, and he was able to point out that he had been on deck of the Cecilia and had seen the Ercolano coming, unlike Captain Michelli. Captain Michelli, meanwhile, was able to point to the fact that while Captain Carson was an experienced captain, he had no previous experience with steamships, and as he departed from Marseille on the day of the collision, he had caused two incidents due to the lack of experience. First, the Cecilia had fouled on the anchor chain of a French ship, and then it had taken away the mast of a small pleasure vessel, all before leaving port. Clearly, this was a sign that Captain Carson had no business being in command of a steamship. The legal battle would still be ongoing in 1858, with both captains doing everything they could to damage the other. The passengers, in their own accounts, definitely agreed with both captains. They had both been extremely negligent, and it had cost 48 people their lives in a very preventable accident. For more information, please see A Memoir of Charles Main Young, Tragedian, published in 1871, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.